Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 62, Drinking the Player Aid. Talking fan-created tabletop game aids. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, li- and live from Windsor, Ontario, the bell- tabletop bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the tabletop bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. So today we are answering a bunch of player aid related questions, all coming from fan of the show Ryan Peach, better known as Red Meeple Ryan to some people. Uh, Sean and I are also going to be discussing the digital version of Terraforming Mars that's on Steam. And I've got a bit more to say about Eminent Domain, and then a bit of a recap of some wedding gaming in our Bellhops Tabletop segment. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some ongoing gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, whether that's positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as tabletopbellhop, one word. Uh, This is a really slow week for comments. Um, I hope this is a case of no news is good news and not a case of people not actually consuming our content and so having nothing to say. I just want you to know, uh, we want to know what you think. Like, I love interacting with people on social media. If I post a review and you played the game, let me know if you agree with my thoughts. If I'm totally out in left field or if we share the same opinion. If I share a list of game suggestions, let me know what I missed or which of the games on the list you played and which you haven't. Uh, I don't care where this happens. It can be Twitter, Facebook, me, we, right on the blog post. doesn't matter to me. I just love interacting with all of you. Now, Ian Borchardt took a moment to comment on last week's Game Room, where Mo talked about playing Paranoia and D&D, reminded us, the computer is your friend. <laughs> yes, Ian, the computer is our friend. Glory to friend computer. I hope you've had your bouncy bubble beverage this evening, I am, e- uh, Ian. I know I have. Uh, speaking of Ian, remember that Star Trek conversation started last week? I read off the beginning of it going between him and Emmett O'Brien. Uh, it's still going. Both Ian and Emmett are still debating how important it is that an RPG teach tone and the ability to tell different types of stories and how that should or should not be reflected mathematically or mechanically. Uh, It's become quite the thread with multiple multi-paragraph replies, uh, the average being about seven paragraphs per reply. Uh, Now, this is going on over on MeWe, and it's worth checking out. Now, I totally plan to share a link in the chat room and a link in the show notes, but as far as I can tell, MeWe doesn't let you drop a link to an individual thread. Uh, So if you do follow me over there, it is on my timeline. It's not too far down, and it's a comment thread on the AMA segment from our last live show. Sorry, not our last live show, our live show from two weeks ago. So it's there. It's on one of the Ask the Bell Hops for the AMA segment. All right, moving on. Chance French commented on our Tyrants of the Underdark review to say, I really enjoy this game. I actually like it best at three. The fast pace definitely leads to the good times of this game. Well, thanks, Chance. I know uh, the Bellhops played with a, a number of player control, uh, player sizes and groups, uh, and is generally loving it overall, aside from, I think, mm. really, the only complaints we've had about it are the art. Uh, yeah. <laughs> which are, which that are, board still sucks. Yep. I, I got to say, <laughs> it's a terrible board. All right. Now, Chance also commented on last week's Gateway Area Control article, uh, Gateway Area Control, Ask the Bellhop article, where he commented, I love Tyrants of the Underdark. I really enjoy <laughs> area control and love how seamlessly this included deck building. Well, thanks, Chance. I guess, I guess Chance really, really likes Tyrants of the Underdark. Um, I, 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 I couldn't tell how far apart those comments were left. I thought it was kind of funny. As Sean mentioned, I am a big fan. Um, I do really dig Tyrants of the Underdark. Now, interestingly, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, but Sean Hamilton, mentioned on Monday how much he's like, we got to play that again. And he's actually looking to pick up a copy. And now Sean, like, never buys games. So this is saying a lot. Like, the fact Sean Hamilton wants to buy a copy of Tyrants of the Underdark, that's high praise for sure. All right. 
Uh, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show. So tonight, a lot of people are talking about Calm and the Cob, because uh, Daniela has just returned from that, and uh, got a little bit of possible con cred coming down from that. No big, uh, no big shock <laughs> the there. Con cred or Cob cred at that point? <laughs> Um, I, I've I, always wanted to go to that one. Um, what's his name? Andy Hop, I think, is the one that runs and organizes that con. Uh, who does the o Odd World? O Odd World, I think, is it's called RPG and uh, on Mother Oith and all some really unique art. And he personally invited me to go one year, but that was one of the first times I went uh, to Origins. And at that point, Origins was my first con, and I'm like, oh, con on the cob. That's way no way. But the more I hear about it, the more the the better it sounds. Yeah, Daniel's... and what's interesting is I low life. Yeah, that was the name of the RPG. Now, what's interesting is just from what I can tell is that con had a complete 180, which is neat because at the time when Andy invited me, it was known to be one of those drinking cons, one of those cons you go to to party. And it sounds like that's changed around quite a bit. I'm not saying it's not a good time. <laughs> I'm just saying the focus is on more engagement and having a good time and interacting with people, and it's more open and inviting. Because not everyone wants to go hang out with a bunch of drunk people. So I think it's pretty cool to see that the con has become more of a, an open, accepting, diverse con than what it was, at, at least back when I was first invited to it. Yeah, Danielle says, uh, you know, I never thought I'd love a party con, but it was so random and fun. Gaming plus karaoke, cosplay, burlesque, Rocky Horror, drag show, wow. even an s and party, panels of just fun, silly things. That definitely uh, sounds, sounds like good. an interesting it, it, and, it, it, and experience and, and enjoyable experience. So yeah, it, it sounds like quite the con. Like I said, it, it's neat that it's changed from the uh, uh, old guys drinking kind of con into something much more diverse. With the, with the growing diversity in the in the gaming community in general, which is pretty awesome. It's it's great to see Andy has embraced that. Yeah, you don't need to go to a con to see old guy old gamers drinking. That's for sure. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> just watch us on the right night of the week, <laughs> and you might see some of that. All right. All right. Uh, today we're talking fan created game aids. So what I want to know from our chat room, for those of you who are there, is a couple things. One, have you ever used fan created game aids, whether it's something you downloaded online or more interesting, if you've ever actually created your own? Um, this goes for any type of tabletop gaming. Uh, there's game aids for RPGs, which include things like DM screens, as well as things like player handouts. And then there's the board game side of things where you've got your, you know, rule summary cards and things like that. And if you haven't created anything, has anyone in your group done it? Like, I know Danielle knows someone named Phil who is known very well for liking to laminate things and create custom player aids. So I know there's people like that out there. I'd love to hear about the player aids you've seen and used. All right, we'll be back checking with Lobby more times during the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head on over to tabletopbellhop.com where you can find a, a spot to click on Ask the Bellhop. All right. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop One Word. Now, the best way for questions to get to us is through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere, but we need your questions. It's been weeks since I've gotten a new question. Um, yeah, we hit a bunch of them during our AMA, but as for stuff that's going down through our blog and like stuff that I log on the Excel spreadsheet to eventually get to, we, we're not at the bottom of the pile, but it's been a long time since we've gotten anything new. So we are always looking for new questions. And if you think something's been asked already, feel free to ask again. Um, we're at the point now where we've been doing this for more than a year. There are topics we covered a year ago that I wouldn't mind getting back to readdressing, especially with game recommendations, because so much new stuff comes out every year. So 8,000 games a year means a yeah. lot more, a lot more out there. All right, well, today we have a question from longtime fan of the show, Ryan Peach, perhaps better known to many people uh, as at Red Meeple Ryan on Twitter. Now, Ryan has a bunch of questions about player aids. What are your thoughts on fan-created game aids? Are they table clutter, or do they actually help? Are they better for new players, or will veterans also benefit? If you use them in your experience, which aids or kinds of aids help the most and least? Are there games you wish had aids, but do not yet? 
Are there games where you feel they aren't needed? Has a player aid like a rule summary ever replaced our game's rule book for you? Wow, Ryan, that is uh, quite the string of questions. Um, there's enough stuff here that we almost could have broke it up into other like separate topics, right? That's one of the reasons I actually didn't do a topic ahead of time on this and write it up as an Ask the Bellhop, because there were so many different things to cover here. So I thought the best way to do it is probably just to discuss it between Sean and I and have more of an open discussion on it. But I did want to talk about this specifically tonight, because looking through the questions, this smacked me in the face, because I am getting ready for the Great Canadian Board Game Blitz coming Monday. So Monday, I am hosting a five-round, no-elimination board game tournament to support our 2019 Extra Life efforts. Now, I am prepared for up to 40 players. And for this event, to handle 40 players, I am going to be bringing 50 different great four-player games for people to play at this tournament. Now, luckily, he's got a van, so no shipping uh, <laughs> charges required. But that poses another problem but people might be able to see us getting to you. Yeah, because one of the many things that I think is a feature of this event is that I don't require people to know how to play the games they sign up for. Uh, while a player who knows the game is going to have a pretty strong advantage, it's not a requirement to participate. So I do this to make the game and the event as open and inviting to the largest number of players possible, especially being a uh, charity gaming event. I want to get as many people out as I can. And this means you don't have to be an uber gamer to take part, as it's pretty unlikely that more than a couple gamers will actually know and have a mm -hmm. certain level of expertise in all the games that they play. Right. But there's always that chance that I'll get a table of four players where no one knows or no one is willing to teach any new players the game they're about to play. Like, theoretically, this could be 50 games I'm teaching on Monday. And while we have spoken quite a bit about teaching, and I think most would consider Mo to be a pretty skilled and knowledgeable <laughs> teacher, Thanks. time means this is impossible. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, past experience running these tournaments, this is, I don't even know, sixth, seventh one I've run. Uh, this shouldn't be the case. It shouldn't have to teach all 50 games. Because in most cases, players actually practice leading up to the event once the game list is out. And... Because there's actual prizes on the line this time, right? This is a competition. Like, yes, every game we play, we try to have fun. But this is where people are going to take it more seriously. People will tend to only sign up for games they already know how to play. But I know I will still be teaching a lot of games that day. And that is where teaching aids, player summaries, fan-created game aids can save my day. Like, save the day for us, seriously. Yeah, this is where places where content from places like the Esoteric Order of Gamers, which mm -hmm. we've talked about many times, can really make things shine. And now, while that is a semi-professional site, it really got started as a fan of games building yeah. stuff. I mean, that's that's what the Esoteric Gamer Order of Gamers is at its heart: is fans creating stuff for yes. other fans. And as far as I know, they're still not paid by any companies to create inserts for them. So. Unlike some of, like, say, the rule teaching video people who were out there who started off doing it on their own are now hired by companies to do That's teaching nice. videos. As far as I know, no one's hired the Esoteric Order of Gamers to do a box insert for them. Insert being some not a not a separate the pieces, <laughs> but a uh, <laughs> addition box, addition game edition, player aid. Yeah, because what happens though, like in in some cases, the right player aid can literally eliminate the need for me to teach a game. Either the game's simple enough or the player aid is clear enough that a group of players who've never played the game before can just go off that sheet, set of cards, whatever physically it might be, and actually use that tool to teach themselves the game. And I got to say, that's a godsend for me as an organizer for these events, because all I need to do is basically check in, right? Walk by the table. Hey, you got the sheet. You're reading through the sheet saying, do you have any questions on what's on the sheet? No, you're good. Good. And then I can move over to a table and focus on a game with less experienced gamers or people who, even if they are experienced gamers, are playing a game that's much more difficult to learn. Yeah, no, absolutely. We've... Uh... Efficiency is what matters. With limited time to get through the rounds, you can't spend even half an hour teaching 50 games and still finish yeah. during business hours. Yeah, and we, we leave room, right? Like, uh, if, you, if anyone is, has looked at the event page or the stuff I've done, I have not announced the official timing for every round. I have just said we are going to play a short round and a second short round, then we're going to play a medium round and another medium round, and then we're going to have dinner and then we're going to play a long round. I haven't said what that is. So, but I've set up the game. So like the short round, the first one, really, I'm hoping people are going to be done in half an hour. 
even though my time slot is an hour because I never know how many people I'm going to have to teach. Even if it's a 15 minute game like King Domino, if I have to spend the time teaching that and someone else is ready to sit down and play some Sagrada, I got to get to all those tables, right? Now, the Blitz is definitely the event for which I am most thankful for included with the game and fan created play rates. But I'm also a big fan of using them with all my games because I tend to run public play events, right? So I will bring them out to public play events and I will have them in the thing for the same reason when I'm co-hosting weekend events because then they're there, right? I don't have to necessarily be the one to teach the game if those are in there. Plus they help me to be able to teach it because they'll summarize a game I might not have played in a long time. But I also keep them for my home games. Um, same deal, right? If I break out a game I haven't played in three years, I'm so relieved when I got that sheet on the top of the box. I'm like, oh, good, a summary, because, you know, I kind of remember this game, but I don't remember it perfectly. Like, in general, I got to say, I am a huge fan of play rates, right? Anything that's going to help reduce setup time, make games easier to teach, make games easier to learn, or help organize information that you need during the game so it's easier to access. That's also another big part of player rates. Yep, and we've spoken in the past about how the uh, Great Toronto Game Lending Library includes SDTR order sheets or other sheets mm -hmm. in their games as part of the pack. So when you go to a con that that they're at, you go and you get a game from uh, from the, from their library. When you get to that table, yep. not only have they got their own custom uh, piece, you know, containment mm -hmm. system, but they've also got that esoteric or similar sheet in there, so that. You know, if it's the first time you've played it, you can probably still get up and running way faster than if you had to get through that whole rule book. Exactly. And even if it's not, even if it's a game you know, right? It's that refresher. It's that quick. Like, uh, for example, I remember you and Deanna had played Suburbia using yep. the tabs library. And Deanna's like, yeah, I know Suburbia until I sit down to try to teach Suburbia. And like, ooh, wait, maybe I don't. And then you <laughs> grab it and you're like, oh, here, wait, here's a nice summary. Yep. Much easier. And in that in that case, you know, I had never played Suburbia. I didn't know anything yep. about it. But I was able to sit down with that sheet and go step through the phases and go, oh, okay, this makes mm -hmm. sense. And no, I'm not going to know all the, you know, ideas and you know everything perfectly i'm not going to make all the gr greatest moves because i don't know the theory behind it all but i know right. all the actions and the actual turns and everything uh and let lets us yeah, say, exactly. you know, get playing so and suburbia while not a heavy game is not a light game by no, any no no there's definitely some tricks and uh you know i'm I, i've i've now played the uh the digital version many times but yeah. at the time uh it was all new to me so getting back to ryan's actual questions some of yeah. which we may have already covered in part yeah what are your thoughts on fan created game aids? Uh, like I said, big fan of game aids in general. Um, like, I, you can find them everywhere, right? We keep talking about the esoteric order of gamers, they are the gold standard, right? They that they it's a, it's a group of true fans that like they go a step above. The one thing that I find esoteric order of gamers does that other people don't do in it, it's flash, it's not necessary, but they make their inserts look like the rule book, like they stick to the aesthetic of the game which I think is a really nice touch. But to be honest, sometimes all you need is a notepad file. And you can find those on BoardGameGeek. So uh, we talk about BoardGameGeek a lot, but just in case you've never been there, BoardGameGeek is a massive database that has listed every game, I would almost say, in existence. But any game you're going to care about, we'll say. Like, if it's if it, if it's not on BoardGameGeek, you're not going to need a rule summary sheet for it. We'll just say that. And you can... Search by the game. Once you find the game, if you scroll down, you'll find a section called Files. And I got to admit that there are so few games out there that don't have something created by someone to either help you learn, to help you track something, to help you get the score. Um, like, to be example, we're, we're talking about game aids. There are all, all kinds of game aids. There's something I hadn't even thought of. We could probably list all the different types. <laughs> but, like, the type of thing we're looking for is you're going to find... Rule summaries, right? That's your basic, here's how to play the game in a shorter, condensed version. There's going to be player aids that could be all manner of things. They might be the turn phases. They might be the economics of the game, the different prices of things. Like, for example, Settlers of Catan gives every player a card that shows you how much it costs to build a city and how much to build a road. There could be a list of the turn steps, what all the different rounds are. If it's an action selection game, what all the different actions are. A list of all the icons that are on in the game. Uh, Race for the Galaxy has a terrible fan non-fan created insert to teach the icons it's horrible it's two-sided and it's supposed to help you teach the game it's terrible there are some great ones out there on the internet and in general like I, fan created game aids are awesome 
There's also the there's also is, a whole other sl- selection of stuff that aren't necessarily in there to specifically help with the game in the way that we've been talking about. But there's great stuff like if you play DC uh, DC Deck Builder, there mm-hmm. are table mats or table mat designs, yes. uh, player mat yeah, player mats and things uh, for all the games out there. Mm-hmm. Now the one thing we you do have to worry about, I would say, is that. On BGG, there is also a lot of player-created stuff that is not necessarily the game rules, but there are alternative (laughs) rules and things. So the one thing you do have to look out for and be careful of is to make sure that if you're finding a player aid, it's a player aid for the actual game, Mm -hmm. and it's not not something for a variant that you may not be looking for. And and it may be a great variant, and I don't want to destroy that, but if you're looking to play the original game and learn the original game, do that before you move on to the variants, because usually there there's mm-hmm. enough of a difference that uh, you don't want to be you want you want to make sure you're clear on the original rules and then yeah. clear on a variant that is a, and and clear that it is a variant. Yep. Yeah, I've done. I totally forgot about game mats, but like I I printed stuff up for dice masters and I got it printed on mouse pads, but I used someone's fan made art to do that, which was free to use. That's another note: don't steal people's stuff when you're making these. Don't steal people's artwork. Make sure you credit. Make sure you check if you're making your own additions, even if they're free to use. Make sure you're under the right license. Not everything is let you bring it out to a game club and use it in your game group. Um, another one was score sheets. A lot of games seem to lack score sheets. Like if you played any Steffenfeld game, there's like 80 things to count up at the end of the game. And they, for some reason, the companies that put out Steffenfeld games don't like to include score sheets. And there's probably other stuff, right? Like we're mainly talking board games, but like RPGs, you've got... All your charts, right? You got your DM screens, but you've got spell charts and spell cards. It's, cards are becoming very popular. For the number of people that hated on 4th edition D&D for having card-based things, <laughs> the number of cards you can buy for 5th edition to me is kind of telling. Because I think everyone I hates the idea that their role-playing game might feel like a board game, but man, it's nice having a card instead of having to flip through a book. Um, well, and little things, I mean, I, it's, it's different now. I think uh, more uh, games are uh, aware of how important character sheets are and how important character sheet design is. Mm -hmm. But back in the day, I mean, when, when, when I was actively role playing a number of different systems and playing every week, uh, I was building my own, Mm -hmm. I was sitting down in Excel and building my own uh, character sheets because the, the crappy little thing you found in the back of the book, the back of the book just wasn't as helpful as it needed to be. And as expansions came out or new, you know, new skills and powers or whatever came out, they didn't always update the character sheet. And so mm-hmm. building your own character sheet was a way of life in the early internet. I mean, yeah. I remember, you know, BBSs and, and, and early uh, websites that were just... Well, you know, downloading them, yeah, yeah. They were, they were custom character sheets. You know, and, and, you know, some people would go crazy and, you know, hey, hyper card your character sheets and you could have the mm-hmm. whole uh, database, uh, you know, relational databases. Um, now, thankfully, game designers have figured out that character sheets are important and, and they should spend a little bit of time and money and effort designing them well. Um, so to be and honest, even nowadays, I can't think of a game I couldn't find someone's custom character sheet Oh, absolutely. For. I mean, everyone's always like, going to have one. People are have still their... doing that to this yep. day. People are making their own versions. I said Dyson Logos does some amazing OSR ones with his art style yep. that I just love. And, and, and the then fact some of the people is, do some really... The fact of the matter is, I mean... A lot of people are moving more towards a digital, you know, less less tree killing mm-hmm. side. So if you've got a editable, you know, character sheet on your tablet that you bring to your thing, mm-hmm. you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, people were talking earlier about uh, laminating or using uh, page page protectors and and red on mm-hmm. wipe off markers. Well, if you got a tablet in front of you, you don't even have to worry about that. Yeah, and even going more modern, you want to talk about fan created player aids? There are fan created apps. The Gloomhaven Helper app was not Absolutely. put out by Cephal Affair, yeah. right? Like, that thing is amazing. That was created by fans to make Gloomhaven more accessible and easier to play. Uh, and speaking about accessibility, Ryan, who is visually impaired, did know that files with card text are huge helps to people with visibility problems. Just a file with the card text of all the different cards in the game instead yep. of having to try to read. And I'm getting to that point, I just getting old, where sometimes I wouldn't mind having a player aid with a number of all the different cards in Terraforming Mars and what each one does, because well, my and, vision's not as good as the And game. you pointed out the problem, you know, on a big table when you're doing that DC deck builder. Um yeah. and, until you get until right. you are used to the cards and 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 familiar with the cards so that you see Robin and you go, oh, okay, I know what Robin does because blah blah blah, then mm. you know. 
it's reading it is a pain and and be, especially when yeah. you when you're playing on the larger tables it's not quite as bad at my place but uh i i need to make sure the lighting's right and and things yep. or i struggle too yeah it was even tante coro Corey. Oh, yeah. tante Corey was even the, the small text on those cards my god but yeah so fan create game aids mostly positive i gotta say though the quality does vary um I mentioned Board Game Geek. If you Google a game, you're probably going to find fan communities. If it's a big enough game, you'll find forums, blogs, etc., Facebook groups dedicated to the games. Those are also good places to find fan-created game aids. Um, just in general, some are going to be more so useful than others. Personally, I like Board Game Geek, right? Because Board Game Geek is great for that because the files have they have their thumb system, right? It's their it's their Reddit up and down arrow. It's it's their way of of saying, hey, good post or bad post. Well, there's no bad post. It's just good post. You can you can thumbs up stuff. So if you filter the file section by thumbs, you're probably going to, you know, do the whole separate the wheat from the chaff, right? You're going to get the good stuff's going to bubble to the top because some of it is more useful than others. Some people have created some files that I'm sure help them or they felt necessary, but I don't necessarily find as useful. Um, the other thing to watch for is comments, again, on Board Game Geek because people do get things wrong. Um, always make sure you have the latest version. Usually when people do get something wrong, the board game geek community is rapidly quick at pointing it out and then people will have to update their files. Yeah. Uh, another, uh, another handy little thing, uh, accessory that, that we've talked about recently, uh, playing, uh, with is dice rolling, uh, accessories, uh, whether mm -hmm. they be dice towers or the wonderful little dice tray that uh, mm -hmm. that we've been able to use those are great um sorry I, I just got distracted because i just looked i actually just googled gaming gaming aid tabletop gaming aids to see what came up and the first website actually has a friend of mine speaking at a conference online <laughs> that i didn't know cool. about um <laughs> which just kind of threw me I, he's actually he's actually a cthulhu um lovecraftian uh academic in in florida okay uh but I knew him as a vampire, the magic player in London. <laughs> and apparently wow. he's doing seminars online. Um, Very cool. Yeah. So uh, let's, let's, so I think we've talked about what's there. Uh, you know, what are our general thoughts uh, now? Are they table clutter or do they actual help actually help? And I think we've, we've pretty much uh, given our opinions on this, but. Yeah, like it, it really it depends on the, on the quality of them. I I can't think of many examples where they're just clutter, right? Because the other thing too is God, just put them away, right? Like if you don't need them, you you just you use them for the first couple of games because that's in most cases that's what I find, right? So an example of this is Terraforming Mars. I don't know why there's only two sets, but there are two sets of cards, and there's like ten cards in each set that it basically explains all the rules of Terraforming Mars over ten cards. And even though it's a five player game, it only comes with two sets of these. They're useful, but I find like when you first play, they're not good for beginners because it's too much info. It's like, oh my God, there's these 10 cards of stuff I have to learn. But then once you played for a bit, it's a good reminder of the things you can do. So I kind of like to break them out halfway through the game. But I always find by like the second game, I'm not even using them anyway. Because most of the information is on the board. All the projects you can do are on the board. Um, most of the card interactions aren't explained on these summary cards they just tell you the different actions you can take so you know what they're out there the first game while i'm describing things i mentioned they're there if people want to pick them up and look at them while i'm teaching because as we talked about in our teaching episodes some people learn better by listening some people learn better by reading but after that i put them away i put them in the box right like i like i don't see how they could just be considered like if they help at all why not is more what I'm thinking, right? Yeah, and then just put them away if you don't need them. I think it might be it might be a bigger issue when you look at the RPG world. Uh, again, with board yeah. games, a board game is designed so what it comes in the box, you need it, and everything else is extra. And as we said, you know, put it away. Whereas an RPG game, uh, things can get a little out of hand. So if you've got, you know, a five-page character sheet because of all the different details you've decided to put in and full-page double-sided character art that you drew of your character. Um, think about your table mates, you know, yeah. or how much space are you taking up and how much of that actually needs to be spread out in front of you, especially if you've also got your dice tower next to you because you only can write, roll your dice in your dice tower. And you've got, you know, there's... I, I, when it gets to RPG, because there is so there are so many things available, there are yeah. so many things you could op, should choose to use um, to help or not. Uh, if you use them all, then it can become a table hog. Yeah. 
uh, and and I can see you, you know, interfering with the space and and comfortableness of your friends at the table there. Yeah, I can see that too. Like especially like um, you imagine playing a role master game where the DM had laminated every weapon table and put them all out on the table just in case someone <laughs> needed them. Right. right. Yeah. That, that's what comes to mind. Um, or I'm even thinking of a couple con games I played where there was an awful lot of stuff on the table, and it was just. Um, for example, Worldwide Wrestling has that to a point because there's a sheet with your uh, almost all powered by the apocalypse, right? Because you have your playbook and then you need the generic play moves that everyone gets. And in that game, there's two pages of references just to show wrestling moves for people who may not know wrestling moves. And then there's another one that shows the special rules for tournaments. And I remember sitting down to play that game and being somewhat intimidated just by the amount of stuff on the table. Now, you didn't have to reference all of that. And a lot of it was just there, again, to help a new player, right? To help a player who doesn't know wrestling. So if they wanted to do that clothesline moves, what's it called? Well, I already called that clothesline. But <laughs> they want to do that move where they toss the guy this way and they're like, what the hell? Oh, snapmare. I do a snapmare, right? Yeah. So it was useful to have, but it did seem a bit cluttered at first. Yeah, and something like that, uh, I, I can absolutely see why for a one-off that they print one copy and, and spread it on the table. Uh, but I would personally rather see that handed out so that when players... Player A is going through and describing their move. Player B can be quickly rifling through a copy of their own to figure out yeah. that, oh, if that's if he's doing a snap mare, then I want to do a, you know, alley oop, whoopsie do, I don't know. Um, yeah. Deshaun needs the sheet. Exactly. I, I need the sheet. So, um, <laughs> you know, you need to be able to plan ahead. And I think I can definitely see how the table could interfere with that. Whereas if everyone yeah. had their own reference cards or, or little booklet, that would be definitely... cards. Cards are definitely, like, cards are nice. They're compact. They're easy yeah. to use. You can randomize them if you yep. don't know what wrestling <laughs> move to do. You know? Yep, yep, there you go. Uh, I am a big fan of cards, index cards, not full sheets. Yep. Uh, so, now, are they better for new players, or will veterans also benefit? I, I gotta say, in general, they're gonna be invaluable for new, or can be invaluable for new players, right? Like, uh, just in general, rule summaries, just... If you have an action selection game, you better have a card in that box that shows me what the different actions are. What are my options, right? Why is that not there? Um, and if you haven't done that as a designer, as a publisher, I think you failed. Thankfully, there's people out there who do fan-created stuff, right? Like, I, I realize Ryan's asking about fan-created, but I'm covering both, right? Sometimes the, the publishers are good enough to actually throw it in there, which is awesome. If you have, like I said, action selection games. I can't believe action selection games that don't have them, right? Uh, we were playing one just the other night. I'm completely drawing a blank on the name of the game right now. And everyone I was teaching the game to was like, wait, what are my options again? Uh, Endeavor. I was teaching Endeavor. And there are symbols, but like they're literally symbols. They made the game so it's um, language independent. But like everyone, what's the flag? What's this again? And all I needed was one card. Now I'll admit, by turn two around the board, we had it. And these are experienced gamers, right? I, I think they can be invaluable for new players. And I don't see how they can hurt veterans. Because, again, if I don't need it, I don't have to use it, right? Yep. So, again, board gaming, specifically, if there was an Endeavor card, I would have used it the last time we played. Now, if we had played the second game in the row, I wouldn't have needed it. When I go to teach the game on Monday, I'm not going to need it again. Now, if I don't play Endeavor again for three years, even though I'm an experienced gamer... Being able to remember that the crate icon means draw, which is how I take the top card from an area of the board, is going to be useful instead of having to flip through the rules and go, what the heck's the crate again? Now, and I want to go in, uh, off on, a, on another little way that, you know, when it comes to new players or veterans, I think veterans can actually benefit more in some cases. And my first example that comes into my head is Magic the Gathering. When we sat mm. back at the day, you know, back in the day, Magic the Gathering, you got a deck of cards. And that was it. I mean, that, that's what the game was. It was a deck of cards. But it required you to keep a whole lot of information. Uh, and there wasn't, I mean, Watsi didn't have anything. There wasn't anything out no. there. So we figured out <laughs> how to nothing. use, you know, we went and we bought, you know, little baggies full of glass beads or, you know, 20 sided die to keep track of our things or people made, yep. you know, people, people made all sorts half of different plus counters. One plus one and, yeah, all this stuff. And, and that all came from fan-created gaming aids. Now, WotC, of course, you know, decides to, you know, uh, take over the market, and they can. But the fact is, I don't think they ever will win because it started off as a fan thing. And now mm -hmm. if you go to Etsy, uh, for any game, you know, if uh, another perfect example was uh, the Archon. Keyforge. Uh, Keyforge. Um, you know, 
yes, Keyforge had the starter deck that had all the different things I could have gotten, but I couldn't get a copy of that without spending a, an unreasonable price. Mm -hmm. So I went to Etsy and I got what, in my opinion, is a far superior product mm -hmm. made by a fan of the game to, you know, compensate for the, the deficiencies in the of official manufacturer's product. Uh, and, and that doesn't really net, uh, benefit the newbie as much because, again, the newbie can just go out and buy the first person starter box. Uh, whereas someone who's played enough of these games knows <laughs> going in that, well, you know what? I'm willing to bet that the stuff you get in that first person box is going to have this problem and this problem and they're going to be chintzy yep. and hard to pick up and all this. But if I go to Etsy and get something nice, laser cut wood, it's going to do everything I need to perfectly mm -hmm. and just make it that much easier for me to play because I don't have to worry about fiddling with tiny little pieces of cardboard or losing them. Mm hmm. So just trying to jump back to RPGs, just trying to think of a difference here. Again, same thing, right? Like, um, I, I think of cards, cards, spell cards, right? Think of a brand new player who's never played a wizard before, be able to hand them just the first level spells yep. and say, pick two of these, right? I, I'm sorry, I don't play fifth. I don't know how <laughs> many spells you get at first level, but I'm just coming off the top of my head. I'm sure it's something like that, right? Wizards have to pick their spells or even more so a cleric. Here's all the spells you can cast. As opposed to, yeah, go to page 84 and flip through those 240 pages. Like, I don't know, again, at 5th edition, I don't know. But in the old editions, the spell part of the player's handbook was two-thirds of the book. Like, that was two-thirds of the rules were the different spells for all the different things. And what's the difference between a ranger spell and a wizard? Instead, here, here's your little subset of the rules. This is all you have to worry about. Don't worry about anything else, right? And where I actually loved what 4th edition did, and I got to admit, this was fan-created. Everyone says 4th edition was card-driven. Wizards of the Coast did not put out cards initially. It's us players. I did it. There is a piece of software called the Magic Card Generator, and it's open-source software that everyone started spreading around on the internet and making 4th edition power cards because it was, it got admitted, board gamers and MMO players who were playing 4th edition when it started out, and they were like, God damn it, I don't want to flip through a rule book. So they put all these powers. If your character can only do seven things, why not just give me those seven things in one place? And that eventually switched to the, the WotC character builder. When you printed your character, it gave you extra sheets that were cards, basically. You could cut them out and sleeve them, and you'd have your powers. We just kept them in cellophane sheets at that point and crossed them off as we use them but it was actually the fans that started it and watsy going damn that's a good idea right and then warhammer third edition came out and fantasy flight went whoa role players are willing to accept board game components and went all in and all these people were like ah it's not a role-playing game but all it was was a way to not have to look up stuff in books it was here are all your neat special abilities that would be in a table instead they're on cards so you don't have to flip to that table yep. like i'm a huge fan of like cards index cards um Powered by the Apocalypse took the whole concept of leveling up level charts, power up charts, whatever you want to call them, skill charts, and put them into playbooks. So you get your little book, and then the book's like one or two pages usually. Some are a little thicker depending on the game. And when, here you go, right at level one, you get your playbook. And you're just going to check off stuff as you go. All the information you need right in these sheets. It's brilliant. And again, I think it's driven by the fans Trying to, no one wants to grab that 300 page. I brought it downstairs. I grabbed my DCC book right now that's like 700 and some pages. No one wants to have to flip through that. <laughs> All right. Well, now if you use them in your experience, which aids or kind of aids help the most and the least? And I'm actually going to start off on this one because I know Ryan asked this question. And I think one of the biggest things that you can do, and now this is not necessarily player created aids, but upgrading some components. Because mm -hmm. so many of these components are not accessible. So if you can change those cruddy little cardboard uh, money tokens to clays that have real values on them that you can feel and touch or different sized and shaped tokens with different edges so mm -hmm. that Ryan can reach into that bucket full of money and know what he's grabbing without having to be able to see what's on them. Um, and whether or not, you know, you're actually buying fully new components or you're buying something like the coin holders uh, and etching them or some other way of making your game more accessible. Uh, these are these are all things that are absolutely, you know, mm. can aid someone, a, a player like Ryan, immensely and are just invaluable. Yeah. Changing the cubes into something three-dimensional. That's a huge one. Endeavor is an example of that, though it's the Kickstarter edition that made the difference. But instead of having a cube to track your... I'm going to forget the different things, your income and your prosperity and your building level, your industry level, 
the, the, the industry level becomes a pile of little bricks and the influence is a shield and they're very distinct to touch, which is great. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, we think, and, and, and Anshi Games points it on library, uh, so often we think of it as really nice upgrades. Oh, it's so nice to have clays yeah, instead, of, instead of whatever. But the fact is, for, for people like Ryan, uh, it, it's the difference between being able to play and not being able to play, play the game. Yeah, Ryan, I know, is doing a big thing with coin capsules to, yep. to cover tokens now. And then you can get different shapes or thicknesses of coins where you can you can etch yeah. them or you can put something on Braille on the coin cap, which is awesome. Yeah, coin capsules are so, a fantastic uh, resource. Yeah, it's something I'd never seen. I, I think Ryan was the first one to mention it on Twitter, and I was like, damn, that's brilliant. I never – even just protect your components, right? Yep. Like just yep. as, a, as a component upgrade, like if I owned a board game cafe, man, maybe I should put my chips in, in here. So some of the, the, the most useful player aids to me, um, set up instructions. Give me a quick set up instructions so I don't have to flip through the rule book to find the section so I remember how many cards we draw at the beginning of the game. Or if I remember, okay, first player gets this, and what's second, what's third, and what's fourth get? Because every game has that. It's always different. It's never someone starts at three, the next person gets four, the next person gets five, the next person gets six. The next game, it's oh, first person gets two, then three, then three, then five. Yeah. It's always different. Just give me a little thing that tells me how to set up the game. Where do the card stacks go? Where do the starting resources go? What are the difference between two, three, four, five, and twelve players? Please give me some setup instructions and, pulled from the main rulebook. And even though, and even though the main rulebook always has them, where in that rulebook ha- they are, or even if they're That's all not compiled in one spot, like sometimes you know, page six, three quarters of the way down the page, it will be listed there. But mm-hmm. that's page six, three quarters of the way down the page. Um, yes. There aren't enough games where, you know, page two, you know, because you have your intro and your artist's credits on page one. Yeah, usually you have your intro and your components. Yeah, and then page two, give me that setup. Before you tell me a thing about the game, give me the, this is how I put the game out on the table. Uh, Or I'm going to get a card for it. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Next rule summary, right? Take that. 45 page Gloomhaven rule book and distill it down to four printed sheets. That's an example of one of the ones I've done. Four printed sheets is still a lot, yep. but it's still way better than 45. Uh, if you can get Gloomhaven down to one page, I'd be impressed. <laughs> uh, I don't think you couldn't cover everything you have to. I literally have four pages that pretty much covers every little thing that could happen in Gloomhaven. It's pretty impressive. It's it's We had it in the box for a long time. Now, I got to admit, we had another five page one that was just a flow chart on how to move the monsters, but... <laughs> That's more of uh, how difficult the rules are to implement sometimes versus. So any form of rule summary, I have seen some fantastic ones over the years, and I've seen some terrible ones. Uh, this is the main thing I'm looking for from Esoteric Order of Gamers. Uh, what I really want is both. Yeah. Give me a setup and rules, right? Uh, and condensed as quickly down as, as succinctly as possible. And now this next one, I think, is so many games do it well, but not every game. And that's what is so frustrating because there is just no excuse not to give us turn sequence clearly, yes. easily for like, every player, yes. enough for every turn player. and round and what the difference is. <laughs> and, and if there, you know, and if you've got actions available during each, during each turn, let us mm-hmm. know. It, it's, if you want us to be able to play a complex game, uh, that, that, in, that is, that is thought provoking and involves a whole lot of, of interaction between players with different rounds and different sets of actions you can take at different rounds to really bring you into the simulation. That's awesome. But don't make me fight to remember what the it is I'm supposed to do every time. Wait, what are my options again? Yeah. You know, it's, it's a, it's a bad that that's needed when you're teaching the game. What, wait, what can I do again? Or what'd you just do? I didn't yeah. remember. I didn't know you could do that. Yep. Yeah. And even, cause even games that do it well, aren't always perfect. And I think that might've been yes. part of my problem with, um, um, race for the galaxy no no uh the 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 trucker not galaxy truckers the the, the oh, ship uh wasteland express wasteland express so. um i think it had no summary well it had it, it had some information on the player cards and i think i was trusting that to be enough information and i was right. mistaken um whereas i think if i i think if i if Asterix got something for that if i ever sit down at that game again yeah, they probably do because i still swear as badly as i did at that game i still want to try it again and and see if i can actually honest, play it 
I haven't broken it out since that night. So yeah. that's how often that hits the table. Well, it's a, you know, it's a complex game with a lot of moving pieces that takes a large chunk of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is easy to mess up early on and, and yeah. completely destroy your hopes of winning <laughs> yes. because you grab the wrong mission card that you can't, you mm-hmm. don't really have a chance to do. Um, All right. So an added bonus, a how to teach. These exist. You don't see them often. I have seen games that were literally read this out loud to the players. Those are amazing. Uh, jumping to role-playing games, I mentioned Worldwide Wrestling need a lot, needing a lot of uh, ephemera out on the table. But man, that book includes a how to run a one-shot. And there's a PDF version you can download off Nathan's website. That's uh, ndpdesigns.com, I think. See how well I know my web page is off the top of my head. Um, you can download it right from there. And it literally says, read this out to the players. And it's like, you are stars in a wrestling match. I'm going to be doing this. You're going to do this. Now grab this sheet and do this. I'm like, that is amazing. I'm like, that literally tells me how to run a one shot of worldwide wrestling for the first time. And even if I've never emceed a game before, I'd know how to do it. Um, another example is, um, oh, what is it? And I'm like, Euphoria, build a better dystopia. Had a nice thick card that's the size of the box. They literally said how to teach this game. So you read the rule book, but it knew that at least one player in your group was going to have to teach this game to everyone else. And it tells you first show this, then teach this, then do this. Uh, Another example is Dungeon Lords. Now, Dungeon Lords, interestingly enough, says go through this part with your players, then ask if they're having fun. And if they're not, go play something else because this game's not for everyone, which in a way I was actually really thankful to read. I'm like, that's really cool because I got to admit, when you look at Dungeon Lords, you think you're going to have this fun dungeon romp and it is one of the heaviest games I own. And you might have got the game thinking you were going to be playing Dungeon Dungeon Keeper, the video game, which is kind of what it looks like. And it's not the silly fun that is Dungeon Keeper. This is a really difficult resource management game where you're really backstabbing the other players by trying to send the heroes into their dungeons instead of yours. And the game recognizes that. It's like, once you've reached this point teaching, ask the players if they're having fun. And if they say no, stop. And I'm like, that's great. So yeah, if you can, like, that, that's secondary. If you can give me a how to teach, that's awesome. It's great to see, but... It's not something you see often. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and, and again, that's that tends to be a little more niche because, you know, I I don't I would say that the majority of the board game market aren't necessarily going to be teachers other than within their own close group. And so that's not necessarily as vital. But again, yeah. that's where the fan-made aspect of that comes exactly. in great. Because I don't think a manufacturer has any need to go through and make something like that. Yeah, but it's perfect it it, that when someone like Mo, uh, who is going to be out there teaching, is out there, you know, can have that uh, available to them, whether it's through Board Game Geek or Esoteric Era, mm-hmm. or just, you know, some guy who is a huge fan of Terraforming Mars and has yep. decided to go in and, you know, do everything they can about it. All right, the other aid that I have listed, there's probably ones I'm forgetting that I love, is icons. If your game has icons, give me a list of them and what they mean, please. Uh, Daily Magic Games, for all their Valeria games, are really good for this. They always include a card that is literally all it is, is what all the icons are. Actually, I think it's the back of the turn summary card, but still, I, please show me what all the icons are. Uh, Race for the Galaxy is one that fails on this, because with every expansion, they added more icons, and you have to check different books to figure out what different icons mean. Like, just give me a master list, which is, that's where your fans are out there, as you can find a master list of all the icons and all the different Race for the Galaxy sets in one place. But yeah, please point out what your icons mean. Yeah, Race for the Galaxy is kind of the, the, the master example of horrific. (laughs) It's, it's, it's such an icon driven game. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, it's unintelligible. I mean, they did not design, they did not go through and design icons that were clear and obvious, uh, which, you know, it may, that may be far beyond what they would need. But if you're not going to do that, you need Mm -hmm. to, you need to give people the, the ability to figure it out. And they, they just didn't. Yeah. So that goes on to the bad side. Least give me an icon list. This doesn't have them all. Cause then I spend forever trying to find those ones that aren't there. Um, I don't want a rule summary that all it is is the final scoring. I've seen that many times. Like, here, here's how to play the game, and it's just all the different things that are worth points. I'm like, well, that's useful to have because it's telling people what to play for. But if that's all you're giving me, please give me more. Like, give me a full summary. Um, And another one that drives me nuts, now these are for heavier games, is all it is is an index, basically. So it's just all the places to actually find the rules in the book. 
don't do that. Just give me it. Give me the rule then. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I, I took uh, post-it notes and, and referenced my rule books when I was a kid playing role-playing games. Yeah. That's as useful as an index. Why, why? No, just actually, actually put the information on the page. Yes. Don't put page numbers on your, you know, if you, if you want to yeah, put page numbers at the end as a reference to make yeah. sure you didn't screw it up or because there's going to be more flavor text that you might want, especially like spell sheets, you know, spell sheets are a perfect yeah. example. There's not a lot of information you need, but there's a lot of other information that can come in to, you know, to the flavor of, of everything that you might want to be able to reference. But you mm -hmm. really only need to know that it's a somatic and verbal component and it takes two turns to run. And I realize I'm way out of date on my yeah, AD&D spellcasting. But I was also listening to uh, Misdirected Mark last night and they were talking about uh, AD&D spell speeds and things. Mm -hmm. So I I'll blame them for that. There you go. <laughs> Now, on a side note, do include an index. That's important. Just don't make that be the summary. Don't make that be the reference. Please include it. If you've got a rule book that's over 10 pages, include an index. Tell me where the attack page is. Tell me where the initiative section is, whatever. Tell me where the turn sequence can be found. Yep. Um, even worse. Now, I only ever see this in Fantasy Flight, and I honestly don't know if it's better or worse than what they used to do, but a rule reference book. So Fantasy Flight games, uh, to be honest, I haven't bought one in 2019, so I don't know if they're still doing this. But for the last three to five years, when you get it, it has a how to play book, which is very much a how to teach. It's, it's a do this, then do this. And they expect you to be having the game out in front of you with all your players at the same time, teaching them to play. And then they have a full game book that tells you all the stuff they didn't tell you in there. And then they tell you that's all you need to play. But if anything comes up, use this other book that's usually five times bigger than the first two to rules reference. So you're like, OK, you've told me that blah, 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 combat happens. Now I have to grab the combat book. OK, I grab the combat book. Well, part of combat is attrition. Now I have to grab the rule reference book and look up attrition. No, don't do that. I hate it. I honestly don't know what's worse, that or the original Fantasy Flight rule books that were 80 pages for one game where you just had to find that section. So I honestly, maybe this is better than what they used to do, but please come up with a better system. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the Star Wars Legion rules reference version 1.0 right now. And before it gets to the index at the back, it is 48 pages yeah. long. <laughs> yeah. What Fantasy the? Fantasy Flight is just... You know, and if like you get I to get 40, it, they're, they're, at 48 pages, it's not a reference. I'm sorry. It's yeah. a rule book. <laughs> it's just not a reference anymore. I, I'm not, not a fan of that. Sorry, Fantasy Flight. Like, I, I get you're trying to improve over your whatever 85-page Twilight Imperium 3 rule book or whatever. I don't think this is actually better because now I can never I, – the worst part is then when we're playing, I can never remember what book something's in. So I'm like, wait, was that in this book? No, was it in that book? And then they forget to put certain things. No, oh, please don't. That's actually one. Fantasy Flight Games fans have made much better versions of pretty much all the rule books. Yep. So, uh, next up, are there games that you wish had AIDS, but don't yet, or at least not that we know of? Oh, definitely. I, 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 this is something that should be out there for everything, right? Uh, most recently was Endeavor, right? We we played Monday. You'll get to hear more about it in our next week's Week in Review because of the nonlinear podcasting. Uh, we played Endeavor, and teaching that game was painful. That is a really simple game. Like, once you get it, it's really simple. But my God, for a Kickstarter exclusive, we 3D printed everything. It comes with box inserts. They even put a U in the box for us Canadians. Like, my God, it is amazing. There is not a summary card that tells you what the different actions you can take are. Like, come on. I'm sure there's one out there from fans. I haven't looked. So this is thing I didn't do. Eminent Domain is another one. Uh, Eminent Domain... I, the original game has a really small print, difficult to read back of the instruction book tech tree for the text, and it's barely serviceable. I basically can't use it because my eyes aren't good enough, whereas Cat loved it. But then I got escal Escalation. It adds in another deck of text that are just as many as the original game, and there's no tech tree. Like, there is no reference. And yes, there is a section of the rule book where it shows three cards per page and I can try to flip through to find the right tech. But like, where's the tech tree? Where's where's that summary? Like, it, like in general, I think every game, like publishers do this, like how much more extra cost, especially if you already have cards in your game to print a couple extra cards. Like it, it's minuscule cost, if any. And I'm willing to pay extra. Like, it, it, like 
I'm all a fan of Esoteric Order of Gamers, and I'm all a fan of fans who make this extra content, but it really shouldn't be up to the fans to do it. So thank you for those of you who do. And uh, I've actually just uh, checked uh, Eminent Domain specifically. They do, uh, on Board Game Geek, they do have an easy-to-read uh, technology card quick reference uh, for the base. I haven't, checked, I haven't checked for the, for the expansion, but it's a I'm really sure it's nice, there. big graphic... And it's yep. advanced technologies, fertile technologies, metallic technologies, front and yep. back on cards, you know, nice and I'm easy. Sure, like I said, I'm sure fans have probably made all of this. So I, I don't know. I remember I was being a game when I was, yeah, you should go back and listen to that episode where I can talk about that game. The most misleading game in my collection. I remember when Shafosa, I was trying to learn that game and I was having difficulty because it is a horribly written rule book. I think we did an entire episode on good and bad rule book back when I played that game because it was so striking. And I could not find a summary anyone had made anywhere. And I was kind of shocked. That was one of the first games I ever, like when I'm board game geek and was like, oh, I give up. I'm going to the file section to find a rule summary. Oh my God, there isn't one. So Shafosa was one, though it, it's it's a dead game. No one said no one really <laughs> needs it. You should just not play Shafosa. Nine thousand new games will come out next year, and seven thousand will be better than Shafosa. So, all right. So, has a player aid rules like a rule summary ever replaced a game rule book? I yeah, uh, it's definitely happened. Um, Egizia. I have a one page game walkthrough that manages to distill the entire game down to one page, like including setup to final scoring all on one sheet. It's color coded. It matches the look of the game. It's got a picture of the board. Uh, it's basically written in a way where you could just start at the top of the sheet and read it out loud. And that would teach everyone at the table how to play. Now, I don't remember who made that. It could be esoteric order. It's one of the first ones I remember finding and falling in love with. And that was going back to the first board game blitz. So I, uh, it's just lived in the box. And that's one where I remember I go to sit down and play Egizia. I'm like, oh, I haven't played this so long. I open it. I'm like, oh, that's right. The awesome rule summary. I forgot that was in there. That's great. Um, and then another one that is an example that comes with the game I mentioned already was Euphoria. It has a nice, thick, two-sided summary board that actually has like a section of often forgotten rules and things to remind players, as well as... Um, uh, the summary of all the different buildings, because there's different buildings in the game, and it actually tells you what all the different buildings are on the back of it. So it's like how to set up, how to play, how to teach the game all on one side, and then the information you might want to reference during play on the other side. It's fantastic. Yep. No, there's uh, there's a ton out there, and I have to say, uh, I haven't used a lot of them, but given my experience with the one for uh, Suburbia that we talked about earlier... Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't ever throw out the manual. You, but you can throw it in the bottom well, underneath yeah. your. You throw it in the bottom underneath your your you know organizer, uh, mm -hmm. and unless you really need it, why bother? Um, because depending on the game, I mean, unless there are a lot of you know Gloomhaven level fiddly bits that you're gonna want to be constantly referencing, uh, for the most part, most games you're gonna be able to look at, read through, you know, get your setup. That's the, the key. Mm -hmm. you know, get that set up all in one spot. Uh, get your turn order and your play order. And the rest of it generally comes pretty obviously or is on the cards or, or whatever you, uh, you might say. So, yes, I would say absolutely. All right. So we're going to check back into the lobby now. You skipped the whole question. Did we? You did. I did. I'll just jump right back over there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so are you games where they, where they feel they are, where you feel they aren't needed? All right. So this is, this is Ryan's last question. So then we'll jump to the lobby. So it's your chance lobby. If you got anything to say about uh, player aids, fan created player aids, or in my opinion, any player aids, whether they're created by the company or not, now's your chance to get it out and we'll address it in a minute. Um, as for games where you don't need player aids, I like I, I don't see why not. Like like how can they hurt? Why why not have player aids? I guess Sean mentioned a couple things with the RPGs having a bit much on the table. I do remember once seeing a DMing with three DM screens, which I thought was a little ridiculous. But I I don't know. In general, they're not gonna hurt. Because like they don't get in the way, right? Like after a while, you use them the first couple games, you put them in the box and you don't worry about them. Or if you printed them, you throw them out, right? 
Um, I can think of like an example of one, right? So Lotus. In Lotus, there are three actions. It's I play flowers, or I recycle my jack, or I play a guardian. That's it. Those are your three choices. And there is a card. Not only is there like a summary card, there is a card in each individual player color presented out so that every player gets one in their deck that describes these three actions. But, you know, like really, that's, I don't, probably not needed. But you know what? The first time you're teaching the game, it helps remind everyone that, oh, wait, yeah, I can play a guardian or, oh, yeah, yeah, I could discard cards. I almost forgot, right? It, it, I don't see how it could hurt. After round two, you'll probably never look at that card playing Lotus. Like, I, I, I forget it's there most of the time. It seems like a little overproduced. The fact they did one for every player, one for the center of the table probably would have been more than enough. But again, it doesn't hurt having an extra card in there. No, absolutely. It's more yeah. useful than the, the card of other games, Renegade Games sells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can we can definitely do without the advertising in our deck builder yeah. uh, decks and things like that. They like to it, do it. It will never it will never actually end, but I can dream. I, I, that would be, yes. you know... Reason, reasons why we don't want game aids from uh, manufacturers is because they'll just find more ways to advertise on them. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's be honest. That's that's what's going to happen. Any any spare space will not will uh, will yeah. be taken up by the latest meeple version of your character for you know fill in the blank. All right, so let's check into the lobby now and see what they have to say about. Play -Rate. Uh, so there's been a lot of discussion in there. Uh, Ryan, of course, was uh, bringing up a lot of information about things like clear sticker shapes or Braille on uh, coin capsules to help identify things, as well as mm -hmm. uh, you know, the shapes and sizes of the coin capsules themselves. Uh, he also points out that he isn't the first one doing it. Others were doing it for a year before he thought of it. Yeah, uh, just he's just happy to have uh, an alternative people. to marking up tokens, which, you know, understandable. Uh, a lot of... People don't want to be damaging things. Uh, and then sculpted resource bits instead of cubes. That's yeah, instead a, of you cubes. Know. That's a big, instead of cubes or discs, right? Like have it physically look, touch, be shaped like the object. Even if it's not, like if you have three different resources in your game and some companies are getting better at this, one should be a cube, one should be a cone, and one should be a cylinder or something yep, of yep. that nature. It doesn't have to be all resource cubes. I realized cubes were a thing. Yep. Um, Ryan wants people to include uh, pencils. If you're going to include score pads, include pencils. I don't know on that one. I guess. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I, you end up losing the pencil anyway, I find. <laughs> that one's not that big a deal for me. The only game I remember that actually came with one is San Juan, the card game. That uh, one doesn't bug me. Uh, Ryan and D are both uh, professing their love for Dungeon Lords. Uh, yeah, it's good. Just man, uh, that's 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 a it's almost race for the galaxy level learning curve the first time you play that game. Uh, Ryan noted he wants a flow chart for combat in Twilight Imperium Four. I only played it once, so I don't remember, but I do remember there was a cycle. It was like first you have orbital bombardment, or no, there was like first if someone has this tech, this happens. Then you do orbital bombardment, and then oh no, before that the PDFs, the planetary defense lasers fire. Then you do orbital bombardment, and then. Your fast ships attack, and then like you need the yeah. I can definitely see a flow chart for that one. And there should just be a card again, right? Like so, here's your combat card. So the Twilight Imperium Fourth Edition E Super Cheat Booklet Version Four Point Zero is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six pages of oh. super dense, color coded, like it's eight still probably point better text. Than the full rule book. Um, it is something else. Uh, they, they left a little bit in the end and they actually have a place where you can, where you can keep notes on the very last page. Um, it is, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure the original, the full rule book's gotta be like in the 40, 50 pages. That's probably just the reference book and not the, the, cause there'll be a learn to play book and there'll be a rule reference book at least yep. if not three, cause that's what fantasy flight does now. And I have to say, I hadn't even thought about this before, but I actually just printed out a fan created rule summary for a video game. Because there you go. I have no idea how to play Small World. And oh, SD Recorder of Gamers has a Small World printout. So yep. I dropped that in there. And uh, <clears throat> there we go. Uh, yeah, we, we should be using them when we play on Board Game Arena. Our Board Game Arena should have them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, we, since we are in the chat room, thank you, Vanielle, for the follow. Just uh, hopped in. Yeah, uh, Danielle did notice her husband Owen is a big fan of laminating. 
Um, we did mention the laminating master Phil Vecchio yeah, earlier. Yeah, I am also a big fan of laminating things. Um, I actually mask. don't have That's a laminator totally specifically because I would laminate everything. So yeah. no, I have one. I, I, I admit I don't tend to use it much for board gaming. I use it a lot more role playing. I, I laminate player aids all the time for various things. Drop tables. That's a cool thing that I. That it's a modern thing that people have come up with, where you you have like a table full of stuff and you drop the dice on it. And where they land matters the same as much as the number on the die. I thought those are awesome. That's a cool player aid that I haven't seen much of before. Yeah, no, absolutely. Although when you say drop tables, I think of little Johnny drop tables, which is a whole different. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> what that means. Little Johnny drop tables is a reference to uh, bad programming where you don't filter your inputs mm. and. The, you, okay. You, you named your child Little Johnny Drop Tables, and the school, the entire school database crashed. Uh, All right. <laughs> super, super geeky humor. Didn't know that one. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> so D, D's points out. You had me until you got to eight point text. Now that actually wasn't the print the printable version. That was the e version. So I guess they expect you to be able to zoom you in on it. Zoom in or whatever uh, there, you there want. There was a printed a printer version that I didn't. Uh, I didn't actually yeah. look to see how uh, crazy it was. Uh, all right. So that is it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read more game gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at table.bellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. Oh, if you got a question for us, remember, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. In the coming weeks, I think I am going to write this up as an Ask the Bellhop article, probably by the end of the week, hopefully, if I don't get too swamped with uh, printing out player aids for 50 games to go to a Great Canadian Board Game Blitz. I think that's going to be my Thursday and Friday. There we go. We keep growing with the support of fans like you. So if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email. It recaps all our content we've released in the week previous, blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, YouTube videos, and anything else we create on any platform. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com website where you can find a, sub spot, a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Now remember... We are back here on Twitch every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern doing some live streaming. We may be playing some digital gaming or doing a fact FAQ read-through. You never know quite what you're going to get. All right, so last week we played some Terraforming Mars on Steam, a three-player, which was, I got to say, a unique experience at best. Uh, you'll hear more about that in our review segment coming up soon. All I can say right now is that we won't be doing that again anytime soon. Now, yes. as for tomorrow, um, I'm thinking we've been playing some Eminent Domain on Board Game Arena, which is bloody terrible turn-based. It is really bad. It is not enjoyable. Um, every three days, realizing you forgot to click follow on an action or descent has not been fun. But it looks like a really good implementation of the board game. And I've been playing a lot of Eminent Domain lately, and I'm looking forward to playing some more. So I'm thinking tomorrow we're probably going to do a three-player Eminent Domain live, real-time, because I think that'll work. Um, week after that, I got no clue. I, yeah, there's I a lot know. of options. Uh, you know, we've got some video games we've been playing. We played, a, we, did, we did a little bit of video gaming on Sunday night. Uh, so there's a bunch of options out there and, uh, we still do have to f edit down the Terraforming Mars FAQ and yeah. get it released, uh, for everyone out there. Uh, what about, um, Friday? Will there be, uh, should be, I, as far as I know, Nurgle, as Nurgle as, has, I don't uh, know. Moved on. Yeah, everyone lately. My mom right now is really bad. So and so far we've avoided it. I'm really hoping it doesn't hit us before Saturday. Um, so we'll see. Uh, yeah. It should be good. If not, we'll stream something. Uh, we we played uh, Star Wars: The Old Republic last Friday because Tori <laughs> and Cat couldn't make it, which that was interesting. Yep. Man, I, it had been way too long since I played that game. I was lost for a while, but then I picked it up pretty quick. Yeah, no, and then, uh, yeah, if we hadn't gotten separated, it would have been... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Probably. All right. Would have been all right. All right. 
up next for Extra Life, uh, this only matters for those of you listening live, is we've got the great Canadian Board Game Blitz. I mentioned it already earlier in the show. This is the big thing that's happening. It's taking up a lot of my time lately. Uh, it's hitting October 12th. I know some of you listening are local, so I would love to see you out. For those of you listening on the podcast, it's already done and over. So congratulations to our winners, and thanks for everyone who took part in the Blitz this year. After that, all we've got left is the big event. The actual worldwide Extra Life Gaming Marathon hitting November 2nd. All right. So this year, the main event we are doing here in Windsor that we're part of is going to be at the CG Realm at 1311 Tecumseh Road East. Uh, store is literally going to open on Saturday, Saturday morning, the 2nd, November 2nd at 10. And they are not going to close until 6 p.m. Sunday, November the 3rd. They are going to be open for gaming for Extra Life that entire time. Note, it is also daylight savings time. So I don't know how many hours that is, but add an extra hour in there when the clocks are going to jump back and we just keep going as if the time hasn't changed. There is going to be a ton of gaming, board games, card games, CCGs, miniature gaming, and more, and it will be streamed. Yeah, we've got, uh, there's an X-Wing tournament. Thank you, Solon, for running that. Um... To be honest, I don't know when that's happening, if it's Saturday or Sunday. I think it's Sunday. Um, I got to thank Steve Joannis for running a War Mahords tournament. I know he's got some kind of awesome promos from Privateer Press to give away for this. Uh, the local Artemis crew is going to be in on Sunday. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't figure. I think they're the, the USS Border City or something like that. They have named their ship. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been involved with that, but you will be able to come in on Sunday and at least see. I don't know if they have room in the crew, but I've asked them to make sure there's, they can at least let people join in in the Starship Bridge Simulator. Uh, there's going to be baked goods and coffee for sale. Thanks um, to the Coffee Exchange for providing that. And then there are the cheat jars. Yeah, that's right. This event, we encourage people to take things a little less seriously and encourage people to cheat. For a dollar donation, re-roll a die, draw another card, move up another couple of squares. Yeah, this is always a big thing for us. The cheat chart is always a ton of fun. It's meant to be a fun, joyous event. If you want a serious event, show up to the Blitz. That's why we're having it on a separate day. We're having the Blitz for those of you who want a serious competition. For the Night of Extra Life, we're doing this for the kids. Remember that. Now, running the entire weekend, starting right from uh, early in the morning Saturday as quickly as we can get it set up until 4 p.m. This is important. 4 p.m. on Sunday, there will be a silent auction. This is going to feature new and used tabletop gaming goodness. Uh, last year, we had some fantastic stuff. We have over 16 board game publisher sponsors this year. We are going to have some good stuff, some of the hottest new games. In addition, we've got a live auction. If you can only come to one thing this weekend, come to that. Saturday, 7 p.m., Saturday the 2nd, November 2nd, 7 p.m., we are going to have a large auction. This is always our biggest moneymaker every year. I don't expect that to change. And this auction looks to be our biggest yet. And if you've been to one of these before, that's saying something. We encourage everyone to join us, and not just those of you who are local. You can do that because we are going to be streaming the entire thing right here live on Twitch. From about 10 a.m. Saturday, given on when we can uh, get the stream up and running, until we close the doors on Sunday, you can watch us live at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. And we're going to see what we can do. We're going to try and avoid just having one big shot of the whole, uh, mm. the whole event. Uh, there's some possibilities. We may actually have a few tabletop cams that we can switch between. Uh, I'm going to be walking around trying to interview people alive mm -hmm. on the floor, playing games, just after games, before games, getting into things, finding out what people are playing and, uh, seeing, you know, how much of this event we can bring to you, the yep. viewing public on Twitch. Now, during that stream, we will be encouraging people to donate. Now you can do that. If you're on Twitch right now, I don't know if you know, if you just scroll down. A little bit below our window, there's a widget down there where you can hit the donate button. We are going to be trying to push that because the whole point of this is to raise money for Extra Life, which supports the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. Anyone who donates to the Tabletop Bellhop, me, uh, to my page, will be sending money directly to sick kids in Toronto. This is a huge hospital that has been having financial problems lately and has been doing a huge drive to try to raise money. They're, they're hurting and they need our help. And I want to do everything I can to help that. And I need your help to be able to do that. And I can actually speak personally because part of my family is employed by sick kids. Uh, yeah. you know, their building is 
horrifically out of date and they yeah. are working on building a new building. Uh, they are still in the process of tearing down the old building because tearing down a building in downtown Toronto is not a quick and simple task. Uh, so they need to get it torn down and then they still need to get all the funds ready to get all those new units built and then get everything moved over. Mm -hmm. And it is a long, slow and very expensive process. But the kids of Canada, Ontario and Canada and Toronto and the world, because again, the Sick Kids for Toronto is a worldwide hospital that helps not only in its research, but also in the actual care of mm -hmm. patients worldwide. Children with strange and, and rare diseases and, and uncommon problems come to get flown into Toronto because they are some of the best in the world. So yeah, join our stream, donate, help us out. We'll all be gaming. You can watch us here on Twitch. And if you're local, come out. Just stop in. Bring yep. us coffee. Play a game. <laughs> Especially the Eat coffee. for us. Coffee is always good. Yes, coffee is good for us. All right. Up next, we've got some thoughts on the Steam version of Terraforming Mars. All right. Last Thursday, I already mentioned this. The entire Bellhop team, Deanna, Sean, and I decided to live stream a game of Terraforming Mars played through Steam. Um... Based on our experience last Thursday, I thought it'd be worth sharing our thoughts because I think people I need to know. I just feel like like before you buy this, I think you're going to want to hear what we have to say. So we're going to share some thoughts on this digital game. Now, this digital version of Terraforming Mars was released on Steam just about a year ago on October 17, 2018. Uh, it's published by Asmodee Digital. Um, this is the official adaptation of Terraforming Mars. There are other ones out there uh, that are unofficial. I've, they've been There's multiple apps that attempt to be terrifying mars this is the official licensed version uh costs about 22 bucks full price canadian i'm not sure what it is in the u.s but when i checked the steam store earlier it was over 22 at full price but as usual with everything on steam there'll be a sale there's always a sale absolutely and i think uh the the you know upfront, it's overpriced at 20 dollars yeah. uh which may be strange because you know the board game is way more than 20 dollars uh, but I remember that you have to have a copy for every, every single person. Player. It The family, you can't family game it. So no. if I buy a copy, my wife and kids can't play it if I'm playing it at the same time. So we can't play together. Yeah. We all need our own copies. So now a four player mm -hmm. game is costing you, you know, $88, 80. which $80. is way more than going out and buying the game. Um, yeah. So yeah, that was a surprise to us. So we tried to use the Steam family deal, which I didn't even know Steam had. So thanks, Sean, for pointing that out. We're like, oh, sweet. I can share my entire library as long as we play at different times. Now, what I didn't try with this is if you can do like the pass and play. If right. you each had a copy. More than, but, yeah, more than likely a pass and play would work. Uh, not but, pass, but you know what I mean? The, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Turn based. Yeah, yeah. But I think but it's still, I think it would be pass and play. It would, it would be pass and play because you would literally have to use one copy on one computer and swap chairs, I believe. No, that's what I'm wondering is if um, she, if we could start an online game and she could log in and play her turn, then log out, and I could log in and play my turn on my PC. Because the thing is you can't do is you both can't right. be logged in at once. Possibly, although it, I would have to say it's that would be even more painful than what we experienced uh, yes, last Yes, it would be Thursday. more painful than what we did. <laughs> so... Uh, all right, so uh, let's start uh, we'll, with the good. Let's let's start with the good yeah, parts. We'll, we'll, we'll there, I have the, to say, there the really are, sandwich. despite what we've said about the price, there really are some fantastic aspects of yeah. this game. Like this is a, I would almost say, perfectly accurate representation of the board game. You have the board, you have all the cards. The cards look like the cards. They have the card art. Uh, to, to be honest, it's a better looking version because like it's animated and you get to see the cities get built. And yeah, I have, the graphics, it, so, the graphics, they have gone above and beyond anything they would need to do to yeah. make this a solid board game reproduction. They've actually gone that next step and made it a decent looking graphical game. Um, yeah. you know, they've got, you can zoom in to a r ridiculous mm -hmm. level and see like details within the cities and the, the animation of the water, you know, assuming you've got your, your video card handles, uh, you know, the full quality, the, the, the ripples on the water and the reflections on the water are mm -hmm. great. So, I mean, you are getting a really fantastically looking game and that goes for the cards and yep. the instructions on the cards as well. 
Now, I will admit, if you don't like the art in Terraforming Mars, which lots of people don't, it's not improved here. It's the <laughs> hard go. art from the game. Yep. I personally never had a problem with the stock photo art. I, it's fine, I think, for what the game is. Um, what I got to say, though, is, is it's got a... They do a very good job at being able to see everything you need to see, but not be able to see it at once. And I just don't think you could do it better. But, man, it's a little difficult at times well I like it, say, it's all there you can yep. find it all and once you learn where they are it's almost logical where it is but it just you can't have everything in front of you at once yeah whereas a board game everything's just laid out it's all there and and i and i understand what they've done my biggest problem isn't as much your information because i i think uh if you get into a flow it becomes a little more natural because you don't, you don't need to see everything all at once. Um, and if you've got your, your flow going, you, you can go, Oh, I'm going to go in, I'm going to do my effect. So I'm going to check, you know, check, do my actions and I'm going to check my effects and I'm going to play these cards and, and everything is accessible and works that way. My problem is more the fact, and I know D, uh, is bothered by this sort of thing as well. You can't easily glance over at other people's stuff. It's all mm -hmm. there. You can look at everyone else's stuff, but it's weird the way it works. And you're sometimes you'll be looking for a tag to see if someone's got a tag and you'll be looking and you can't figure out why it isn't there until finally you realize that you're looking at the wrong player. Um, because yeah. it, you've, you've, you thought you clicked somewhere and you, you didn't you almost... or, or it automatically swapped a character for you while you weren't looking. Uh, and so that's a little on the frustrating side. Yeah, it has, it has, I would call it focus. So you basically can click on what player you're focusing on, yeah. but then when it switches game states. So if I'm focused on Sean, but he finishes his turn, it'll sometimes shift. Yeah. And that's where you get lost. You're like, oh, wait, because Sean finished his turn, it's now focused on me. And it's not always obvious who you're focused on. No, it's not. And I got to admit, it's nice, like, to be able to click on tags and see all the tags. Yep. is awesome like not having to count up my cards for my own stuff and yep. to be able to go oh who has plants i then have to click on each of the players and look at it i would be really nice if that tags tab just showed you all the players yeah like, there's no only reason to max of five like there's no reason i should have to yeah, change there's no my reason focus. there couldn't be so right? like and, and especially the tags because that matters for so many things in terror yeah mind. absolutely even if even if nothing else did that the tags feature could yeah. you know you know yours are right on top and then you scroll down and it's the next player and the next player and the next player or even just call them here's yeah. a column for each of the players right and the other problem um we mentioned the graphics one of the things is this does not look like you're laying tiles which is kind of nice but the other thing is because they're not tiles you can't always tell what they are yeah what well, so well, water is actually a yeah, water is actually a big problem. It's the, the cities are a problem. I know you're you're talking about cities. I think yeah, uh, because you can't tell whether it's a city or an a industrial city or a special tile. A spe you know, one of the special industrial tiles or capital or whatever. One of the things I ran into a problem was was counting the water tiles because they build this beautiful ocean linking all of the tiles, but because they're linked and and pretty graphically, it's not uh, it's not always as obvious because they kind of distort the hexes mm -hmm. when they do it. Uh, so Although is that, is, is it six water or seven water? You. There is, there, there is. is a counter that tells you it's underneath the oxygen and the heat. Yeah. It's again, it's there, but it's finding the info, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's a nice counter that says six out of nine oceans have been played. Or but, I mean, so it a, is there, but, but we're all, but everyone's used to looking at the board and saying, oh, look, yeah. there's six oceans. And you look at the board yeah. and you say, is that six or is that seven oceans? I'm not sure. Yeah. Yep. So that's, that's one of the other ones. Uh, and then, like we were talking about, the different cities. So if you use the ephemeral or you use the um, couple of city or you use um, the mining rights, right? All those, the 10 special tiles that come in the base game are all represented by neat 3D graphics. Yep. But man, some of those look the same as the city <laughs> tiles. Yeah. And Deanna had a solid problem where she's like, I have a tile that says place it between two cities and I can't. Right. And I actually had to go over and look at her computer and see it and go, no, no, the reason you can't do that is that's not a city. That's actually a mine. Yeah. Meanwhile, it's still, it's this kind of bunch of square buildings with a smokestack with smoke coming out of it. It kind of looks the same. So that, yeah, the, on, the that only real difference, bad. the only real difference on that one was the, uh, was the smoke. Uh, and if you yeah. weren't, if you weren't paying attention and didn't see the fact that there was, you know, industrial smoke coming out of that one and not the other ones, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you wouldn't know. And, and there's no reason they can't be color coded, you know? Oh, exactly. White, white for the capital, gray for the cities, blue for industrial, red for whatever. You know, yeah. Make it wildly colored. So personally, what I graphics. would like, 
what I would like is be able to like hit tab and see the tiles. Yeah, yeah, like, make or it hold, look like the board yeah, game, or hold down like, alt. Don't a, hold, a, yeah, a common one is like hold down alt, and everything shifts back to a back to a to different tiles view. Tiles that look exactly like the board game. That would be yeah. nice. No, absolutely, that would be a fantastic uh, addition. Now you're saying you're talking. You're worried about ants being broken. All right, that's get to that. So the ants card has now been looked it up. Ants, and it's any card where you get something for consuming something. Now this goes back to the FAQ. Uh, where we went through the FAQ, where generally if something has a red border, it's optional whether you do it or not. But it's not true if it's a requirement. So ants require you to eat a bacteria to get an ant token. In the game, it let me eat a science cube. Mm. So it let me eat any token. So uh, it's it's a known issue. It's been reported by people. They okay. pointed it out. It's it's out there. But the fact that card's broken made me wonder what other cards might be broken if there's other cards that aren't working right. Now, from what I hear, this game was terrible in October 2018. Like, it was almost unplayable. Yeah, no, and the, the reviews like of I've it from the early really days bad. are very, very unkind. Yeah. <laughs> very, very negative. So people are were not happy with this when it came out, so they are constantly fixing it. Um, which does lead us to something else that it doesn't look like any of the expansions are coming, but I can't say anything either way. Asmodee is really bad for releasing an app and then just letting it rot, basically. So that may happen. Uh, back to some positive things. This tutorial is good. It's, it's solid. It teaches you to play Terraforming Mars. It teaches you how to play this version, which is mainly about where to click, um, which I, I don't mind that. It, it was pretty good. It takes a bit to go through. Like If you played Terraforming Mars, like, all right, come on. Um, single player, I had a great time playing this game, but man, the AI is weird. Um, but the AI just makes me think I stink at Terraforming Mars. Like having played over 50 times, you wouldn't think I stink at Terraforming Mars. But like when I play the AI, they do not play the way any human I have ever played with plays. Um, they are in a huge rush to do standard projects to Terraform Mars, which I someday I'm going to sit down and try as a strategy because it seems to work for the AI. Well, what I what I see is, and and I know you haven't played this way, is I've played the solo solo game, the actual the see, actual, that I haven't tried. the actual uh, all you get fourteen generations and mm -hmm. you have to you have to terraform Mars or you lose, um, and I've played that a couple of times now, and I I believe, uh, in my experience, that's what they're playing. So even when they're playing the group game, Again, they're playing they're playing as if they were playing a solo game possible. where you've got 14 generations to terraform Mars and you're rushing to terraform. Yeah. Uh, and I suspect just sort of thinking about AI things and listening using. that 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 may be how they've optimized the AI, um, which is a choice. I mean, it's not like the AI admit, isn't like, beating I, us. <laughs> yeah, you know. they, they were winning my first couple games because I was so not used to how they played. Yeah. Um, I know the interface is okay. Like it, the weird part is some stuff's hidden, right? So Deanna's in the chat right now and she makes a good point that it is time consuming to look at other people's stuff, to have to change the focus. Then you have to click on the tags. Then you have to find the one you want. And then if you want to compare it to your card, you then have to change the focus back to you. Then you have to open your hand. And by the time you've done that, you're like, wait, did they have six or seven tags? And maybe you got to go back, right? Like, and to be honest, everything you do in that game just takes too long. Like, yeah. like compared to the physicality of I have four cards in my hand, I pick one and I play it and I do the thing. It's like, okay, I got to open up all my cards. I got to click on the card I want to do. Then I got to click I want to play the card. Okay, now I have to click whether I want to spend steel or titanium. Then I have to actually hit play. And then sometimes, but not always, it'll then ask you to confirm again. Yeah. Now, all of this would make sense if there was an undo button. And there is not an undo button. And why the hell isn't there an undo button? Because so many times I misclick something. Yeah. So one of the other things in the game that I really hated was you can drag the map around, which is, to be honest, kind of pointless. So there's no real reason to be able to drag the map around, but you can. And I tried to drag the map and instead place something. And I did not want to place it. I was clicking to drag, not click to place. And I didn't realize that at the time the game was at the point where it wanted me to pick a spot. So I placed a greenery tile where I didn't want to place it. And there's no undo. I'm just like, oh, I'm stuck. I guess I, oh, well, I planted a tree there. And of course, that was one where it didn't confirm. Do you want to place a tree here? Because I, I honestly don't know why sometimes it actually confirms, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, and and what's what, what makes this even worse, again, not only are they asking you to confirm things that you can't undo, 
but they're asking you to confirm things without undo when you are playing essentially your turn on your own. There's mm -hmm. no overlapping. And this is, I think, really what the worst of the problem that we ran into when we played as a group was. We played for five and a half hours. Five and I think. a half hours for a three player game. For a game. simple three player game without expansions. Yes. Um, Players who all know how to play. Yeah. And I mean, Ooh, that's like, to, be, to be completely honest, there was distraction. We weren't, you know, 100% always focused. Uh, critical role was, was taking some of our attention. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, we weren't, you know, going away from the table. We were just occasionally being a little distracted from things. Uh, but the fact that you can't fully play, you know, prepare your turn so that yeah. when it becomes your turn, you're playing boom, boom, boom. Um, it's just, you know, we should all be playing together, essentially. Yeah. And then, you know, when it's your turn, you you say you you know click OK to finish because you've yeah. you've planned it all out and you and whatever they did didn't change your turn, so you're just going ahead. And you know, we could have been done in an hour and a half instead of five and a half. Yeah, and the other thing the game does too is while I'm taking my turn, everyone else sits and watches. Right. Nothing. Yeah, watch they just, just watch. Yeah, they don't the watch you play. Screen. They watch nothing. They just watch the screen. Say waiting for player. So, Do so even though, it. even though Mo placed a tile that he cannot undo, I don't get to see that tile being placed until he has finished all and of hit. his actions, all of his maintenance and hit, okay, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> and then Sean then has to watch a very slow, though you can adjust it animation. Yeah. There is, there is of speed everything adjustment of that. I did, yep. which you can speed that up. Yep. But and there are, there are a but... couple of little bits you can, you can. Uh, skip confirmations on within the state, within the settings, which would have given us a bit of a boost. But I mean, realistically that would have taken us to five instead of five and a half. I think, you know, yeah. maybe uh, at best it was still, um, yeah. it was still painfully long for, Painful. th for three people. Like, again, I haven't played the board game many times, but I played the computer game many times. So and you I'm have comfortable. Played the board game. And I have played it as I've just only ever yeah. played it once. And I, but I have played the video game or the digital version many times. So I'm comfortable with it. D is, you know, a, a, an expert at it. I think, uh, we would all generally admit, and Mo has played it 40 or 50 times. You know, we, we know what we're doing. The game just got us. It just took that long. Just, it took that long. It was just painful. You know, if we got out like, for dinner oh in the middle, God, I could like, have understood. It got to the point where I had a lot of blue actions. So it would be like, all right, Sean takes his turn. Okay, D takes his turn. Okay, Mo's taking his turn. And it would take a long time. And then they'd pass, and I'd take eight more turns. Yeah. Because I had so many blue actions. Where if I was playing the physical game, be like, all right, I put a cube here. I do this. I wouldn't have to click end turn, <laughs> right? I wouldn't have to pause yeah. and then wait. And because we all passed, you could have just burned through it, you know, just done them I all. I could have just burned through it. Like, here, I do this. I get my microbes. I put my thing here. I do my thing here. here. While, you're, while I'm doing that, why don't you guys do production, right? Like. Yeah, it's just there's a lot of stuff that could have been done better. But I got to say, overall, it is a really damn accurate version of the board game. If you want the Terraforming Mars experience, it's there. I uh, ignore the ants. They're working on it. Like there might be a couple little broken things that they're still fixing. Um, I wish you could see the tiles. And I think it's a great play versus the computer experience. And I think it'd be it's a solid uh, turn based hot seat, right? Not even hot seat because I don't want to switch. I, they go online. I take a turn and then Sean takes a turn later. And then later in the day, I check in and take my turn, you know, like play by mail, right? Playing online that way seems really cool. But my God, do not play with real people live. Like, yep. like just don't like there's there's no reason. Like I'm tempted to go in and speed up everything, like absolutely everything. So we don't even get any animations and it's just still going to gonna see, be a four hour. Just to see how fast we could play it. Just to see how fast we can play it. But like, why? Like, it, oh. Yeah. And, and I have just there are some stuff for the board game that it's so hard to find all the info. Like it's so much easier in the game. How many of these tags do you have? Or I can look over, right? Yep. Like when you're sitting at a table, I can see all your player, bro. I can see what your production is. I can see how many cards you have in your hand. I don't have to ask. I don't have to click three times to find out how many building tags you have or how many cards you are holding in your hand or how close you are to getting a milestone. Yep. It, it was painful having to do that switch focus. We only played three player. Can you imagine playing five and having to look through five different players, like yep. list of microbes they have in play at a time. Like that's really easy. I'm playing with real people. Anyone got any microbes? Okay. Yep. Yeah. You got them on tardigrades. Okay, cool. You know, in this, I'm like, all right, click on purple. 
Yeah. Click on tags. Or no, not tags. The other thing. Resources. I yeah. forget what they were called. So oh, realistically, I think the summary I think we get to is it is a great implementation of the game. If you want to play one player, either solo or against the AI, it's fantastic. It is a really good way to learn terraforming Mars, I think. I think you'll be a little confused the first time you play against another real player after yeah. playing against the AIs because <laughs> yeah. we don't know any the players who project. play in that particular method. Um, or we're playing it wrong in real life, and, and but that's a whole different discussion. Yeah. Um, and then, again, as a non-live, turn-based, you know, you know, playing playing on the internet where you've got, you know, five days between turns if you want, I think yeah. it's probably great. So our only caveat, other than the potential little uh, problems with ants, is do not try and use the digital version to play a live, real-time game. You will be upset. Yeah, I, I second that. I agree. So those are our thoughts on the Steam version of Terraforming Mars from Asmodee Digital. Have you played this version of Terraforming Mars? What did you think? Let us know through social media or email mo at tabletopbellhop.com. You can find this review over on our blog at tabletopbellhop.com. You can find reviews like this one yes. over on our blog because I haven't actually written this up. I That's do plan it. on writing it up. All right. Maybe. Probably. <laughs> All right. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Uh, every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's been going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Table. On Our Tabletop. All right. Monday night, I uh, had a group of three people for uh, for game night. Uh, it was my friend Mike and Tom and myself. Uh, Deanna took the night off to get some work done, and we played a couple games of Eminent Domain again. I've been playing a ton of that, trying to get through the expansions I brought home from Origins. Now, this was Mike's first time playing, so we stuck to the base rules for the first game, but then quickly broke out Escalation for the second game. Now, we did leave the scenarios in the box for that second game. Yeah, you know, again, we've talked before about the great ability to build up this game for the newer players uh, by, by adding in bits and pieces as you go mm -hmm. so that uh, they're, they're not uh, knocked on their back when they get the full uh, complexity. <laughs> yes, throw everything at once. Although I wonder, I, I wonder if just starting with Escalation, there's, there's so many tech cards both ways, I don't know if it'd be more overwhelming. Now, I don't have a lot to say about these gameplays. Uh, both games went rather well. Um, I am convinced now that this is definitely best at three players. Um, it lasts just long enough for you to build an engine and run it for a while. Uh, which is nice. With once you get up to four players, it just it's over too quickly. Um, with just the base game, at least with three players, I, I'm starting to I'm starting to wonder if research and technology seems to be a bit overpowered, which is starting to make more sense why they've completely rewritten warfare for escalation to make it more valuable. But now the more I play, it seems like the player who goes for the big research in the base game tends to win. Now, if multiple players go for it, I think there'd be a real competition there. But if one of three players focuses on research, that it's seeming like they may win the game. Like that might be a guaranteed strategy. And I think that was definitely what I found in the two-player game that you and I uh, had the first time. Uh, I got it down. I got it at the table down there. Um, I wasn't leaning completely on warfare, but I did. I went a little bit towards warfare and, and tried to yeah. tried to try to balanced approach. Whereas you went in in on technology, uh, and and definitely took the win because of that technology yeah. uh, thing. So. Like I said, that, and that's the point of Escalation, right? Like, this, this is definitely one of those expansions that attempts to fix the base game or address issues with the base game. Right. Uh, the other thing we talked about, uh, I've been talking about Eminent Domain a lot. We keep talking about how much repeated plays improve the experience. Uh, that's definitely true. The more I play the game, this is definitely a game that rewards system mastery and knowing the cards. Uh, Mike, as he hadn't played before, was a good example of that because he went from feeling completely lost the first game to actually holding his own in the second game, just after one play, getting that, how the cards work, how you hold on to cards, why you might want to burn cards, and so on. I guess say, though, it's, we've been playing a lot of Eminent Domain. At this point, I might actually take a break. Um, I am going to do up a full review of Escalation at some point soon. I do have a whole other expansion to break out called Exotica, but I think I'm going to hold off on that for a little bit just to... I think, I think I've been forcing eminent domain on too many people lately. Though, again, we may play online, but that's, that's a slightly different experience. Yeah, as long as it's not too big of a break that you find a new favorite <laughs> and move on before you get to your expansions. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, I got to get to that expansion at some point. I owe them that. That's worth noting. Uh, note the Escalation is a review copy. I was provided by Ter- Steam Minstrel Games. I should probably disclose that at this time, and as will be Exotica once I get to it. All right. The other big thing that happened this weekend was the local gamer and personal friend Jeff Seuss married his best friend, Sheila. Uh, Deanna and I were honored to have been invited and attend the ceremony and reception, which were both held at Reno's Kitchen right here in Windsor. Well, I think once again, congrats to Jeff and Sheila. and glad to hear the mini moon went well when you got back on <laughs> Discord today. Yeah, I didn't hear much about them. I had to talk to Jeff. I didn't hear. I never thought to ask what they were doing. Um, this was a, was a wonderful ceremony at a great venue. Food was amazing. Reno's is one of the best places to eat in the city. So that's not surprising. Uh, drinks were great. It was awesome to see craft heads beer on draft. Like the only thing you can get was craft heads beer, which is a local brewery. So that was cool. Uh, they had a blueberry wheat and a, uh, honey brown. Uh, even the music was good. Cause I gotta say, it's not often Deanna and I go to a wedding and actually like the music. So overall, it was just a great night. We had a great time. Uh, one of the things that stuck out about Sheila and Jeff's wedding that matters to the listeners here is that they had plenty of tabletop games for people to play. Now, I knew this was going to be a thing going in. Um, I even brought some of my own games to supplement what Jeff provided his guests to play. Uh, there was a pretty decent selection of games, mostly light gateway party style games. Um, Jeff had brought Deep Sea Adventures, Uno, Bananagrams, Lev- Love Letter, Anomia, Red Seven, Skip Bow, Timeline, Funky Chicken, Kerfuddle, and at least two or three others that I totally missed and didn't see. There was a table full. I personally brought Azul, Gokuku, and The Climbers to add to that collection. It's almost like someone, you know, listened to our show and took our advice or something. Yeah, it is that way. I think we did do a whole episode on having games at your wedding and why that would be cool. Mm -hmm. I do have to admit, I don't know how much we inspired Jeff. Maybe this was something he was thinking of ahead of time, but I know he did like the concept when we mentioned it. Now, early in the night, uh, Deanna and I grabbed a copy of Azul, set it up on the patio. Now, this was that time period where we just had the ceremony and the newlyweds leave to go to go get pictures taken, right? This happens at most weddings. Uh, the difference is that the reception was at the same venue, so everyone's just kind of left standing around. Uh, so this seemed like a great chance because this was a spot for guests to mingle. And the one thing that was not... Uh, perfect was Deanna and I didn't really know any of the guests. Like I know Jeff from running the local hack forge and running some game nights with him, but I haven't known Jeff, like say for as long as I've known Sean or any of my other friends. And I definitely don't know Jeff's friends. Like there's not a lot of friends of friends there. So I thought this would be a good time to play some games. So we played two games of Azul. We did get a couple people over. We had some very curious, oh, what are you playing? Oh, that looks really cool. And every time someone came over, I'm like, hit me up later in the night. I'll teach you to play. Um, But it didn't really, no one did, right? Uh, At that point, no one else seemed really all that interested in playing games. Now, again, most of the people there were, of course, family who knew each other. So there was a lot of people just catching up with each other, whereas we were kind of left out of that. So uh, most of the night, I got to say, at that point was people mingling and not a lot of game playing. Now, um, so this is actually kind of ideal. So despite what might at the moment seem like a bit of a waste, you know, it allows people to, you know, conv- the people who want to get, get that uh, interaction early mm. on out of the way, you know, meet the friends you haven't seen for, in ages, meet the family you haven't seen in ages and get that talking done right then and there. And the games, the games don't need to get played. The games are there sure. if they need them. Yeah. Which is a great way to do it. Now, later on, after some speeches and the dancing started and while well, the alcohol had been flowing for a while, uh, people started to play some new games. Um, it started off with a couple kids playing Uno. Uh, then a group went in and started playing Bananagrams. And it was the most intense game of Bananagrams I've ever seen. There was one of the people we had met at the wedding who went in and his wife was playing and tried to interrupt her and got a very stern, get the heck out, I'm playing Bananagrams. Like they, they, This was the most serious game of Bananagrams I've ever seen. Um, as the night went on, there were more and more people gaming, right? So this was an outdoor and indoor wedding. They had the entire venue. There was at least three tables going at once, which was pretty awesome. There was a a table playing Kerfuddle, which is some kind of dice based game. It looked kind of neat. Uh, there was another card game I didn't recognize and Bananagram seemed to be the hit of the night. Everyone seemed to be passing around Bananagrams. Now, interestingly, Deanna and I Never actually returned to playing games, which is not what I would have predicted going into the night. Uh, Instead, we were actually socializing. Yeah, shocking. I know. 
Uh, but it ends up that many of the guests of the wedding were gamers, which kind of makes sense. And it was pretty much there were gamers or there were computer programmers. And there was, of course, the meshing of both. Uh, but most of the people there were role playing gamers. So they weren't actually all that interested in these silly party games. But at the party were Jeff's current RPG group, who are currently playing Delta Green, and his old group. And it was the group that, like, Sean and I split up over the years. So he had basically his old group when they used to play D&D and Shadowrun and stuff. And he had his new group that are more into story games. And that's actually who Deanna and I spent most of the night talking to instead of playing games. So we had conversations about our favorite systems, our least favorite systems, story games, Jeff subsisting with hippie indie weirdo games, uh, D&D, Call of Cthulhu horror stories. They, they couldn't believe I did not like Call of Cthulhu. I blame you, Al. Um, basically, we were having so much fun talking about games that we actually never sat down to play games. Yeah. Now, the folks who had talked earlier and got that out of their system and didn't want to dance or drink then had that different opportunity. Now, once the, uh, you know, once the, once the big thing was over and... and yep. It all broke up. Those games got played. And I think this is really kind of the ideal way to have, and the reason why we talked about having those games at the ceremonies mm -hmm. and at the events is not so that a whole bunch of game p p gamers are sitting down focused on games, but so that there are those options for the people who aren't comfortable sitting and chatting with mm. people or have gotten that out of their system and don't want to have another chat with drunk Aunt Petunia or <laughs> whatever. Um, and it just sort of gives another opportunity or people, you know, you don't want to get into that next political discussion because the elections are coming up. So you go, yeah. and you like them, you like the people. So you go and have a game with them and that way you can avoid those awkward conversations that you're trying mm -hmm. to have. Uh, it's so again, you know, you shouldn't necessarily picture these as a f key feature to the event, but they are a really handy accessory mm -hmm. to the event. Yeah, and they were very clearly presented as an option. Right. Yep. It wasn't now we're all going to play games. <laughs> that wasn't part of it. It was, hey, if you guys are interested, head inside. It did help a bit that it was kind of chilly out and it was an outdoor wedding. So like hit inside to warm up. And then once you were in there, everyone in there was gaming. So that seemed to push it. I just I'm still like in retrospect, kind of shocked we never sat down because we probably could have been playing as well, well having the D&D &D conversations. But it just we the, there was a, a two or three of his friends, older friends that we all just kind of congregated around and right. we just sat and we man we were talking so much role playing and characters and which D, &D version of D, D was the best and i don't know it was a good thing so right. despite not playing nearly as many games as i thought we would i thought i'd be talking for hours here about all the different stuff we played with strangers we did have a fantastic night so again congratulations jeff and sheila on your wedding and thank you very much for letting us be part of it all right now how about a look ahead what games do you have uh, planned for the coming week? Right now, it's the Blitz, right? I got 50 games. I got to make sure all the components are in, all the instructions are there, the exp expansions are pulled out, and I'm going to try to add as many fan-created player aids I can find. So that's a big one. Um, there's certain games I want to get some practice on because I haven't played them in a long time. It's mostly the heavy games that are going to be in the final rounds, right? The ones that are worth the most points. Um, I did get to play some practice games of Endeavor, um, I'm really hoping to get in plays of anachrony and brass before Saturday. Like I, I'm pretty sure I can teach them, but like touching the bits, getting in there and doing it is really going to help my ability to communicate how to play the games better. So that's a big one. Um, then after that's the week after October 19th, this is the one you guys are going to care about if you're local and listening to the podcast is we're going to be hosting a spooky Halloween themed game night at easy mode. Easy Mode has asked if they were if we were interested in helping promote this one. They're going to spend some money on it. They're going to try to make it a bigger event. Uh, they're talking about picking up a copy of Ticket to Ride to raffle away. So we're going to have a game giveaway. That's something new for an Easy Mode event. And what's cool is I have some Halloween-themed trains, so I'm going to add to that pot to, to make it a little more interesting for people. So uh, that's supposed to be our big game night. We're going to see if Easy Mode can get a few more people in. It's not that we've had bad turnout, but it's not... It could be bigger. They have more tables. We could get more people out. So we're going to try to push this one and see if we can get a bigger crowd out. So that's October 19th on Easy Mode, uh, basically at Parent and Ottawa Street, where the old Tecumseh Tavern used to be next to the 7-Eleven for anyone who's local. We'll be there at 5 o'clock till at least 10 o'clock. The place does stay open till 2 if you want to stay late night. Uh, they do serve Walkerville beer, though I don't know what they'll have for food. They've been uh, having issues with their food supplier. Well, that's a shame. 
Uh, and I've actually got going to have some uh, some games to talk about next week. Uh, I'm nice. getting some Duke back on the table, so we'll uh, we'll see how that goes. All right. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers, that we greatly appreciate your support. Mr. John Carney, Evil John, I am very sorry to hear about your recent news. I hope everything turns out all right. Um, stay strong. Wayne, the Star Wars guy, Humfleet. Thanks. Joe Swick, thank you. Jeff Seuss, congratulations again. William Fisher, thanks. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts creating this content, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. You can also catch the Tabletop Bellhop table, Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30 p.m., mostly playing Gloomhaven, but now and then we'll surprise you something else, else like Star Wars Knights of the Republic. Yeah, Star Wars The Old Republic, <laughs> the old not Republic. Knights. That's a, Star Wars The Old Republic, the, old the Republic. MMO. Yeah, we dusted that off last week. Just to see if we might get watchers playing an MMO. Why the heck not? Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the Penthouse Suite for an Off the Books After Show and our new tradition of raiding another tabletop Twitch streamer at the end of the night. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on. Good night. <laughs>